The secret of life is putting one foot behind another and taking another step each day. Amen? You know, I've talked to some people and heard speakers talk about suffering and the things that you go through and many go through. And they say, sometimes you just got to put that one foot in front of the other. But my question to you is, how do you do it when things get really hard? How do you live with resilience and hope when everything is coming against you? Or to put it another way, how do you endure with joy when there's so much sadness? Well, this morning we're going to see the beautiful balance that the scriptures give us. A living boldly and joyfully in the light of eternity. So let's stand for the word of God. Romans 8, 14 to 25. And so I, I carved up the, the last subsection, so we're right in the middle of it with my Thanksgiving knife for the turkey here. We can do it. Beginning in verse 14. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. Now, now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. For we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. The word of the Lord. All right. Please be seated. Hey, I forgot to mention, and I, I can't be forgetful as I get older, Brian has asked all the families of students here to meet right after I'm done preaching for a special meeting between services regarding the youth ministry. So forgive me for forgetting that, okay? We're good forgiveness-wise? All right. Thank you. Thank you. I didn't want to forget because I'd be thinking about it through my whole sermon, the things I forgot. All right, three principles. And uh, this is a RWG, resting in our adoption, waiting with certainty and hope and groaning, certainty and joy, excuse me, groaning with deep hope, resting in our adoption. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. And as some translators put it, the glory that is to be revealed in us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. All right. Resting in our adoption. You know what? And I didn't read far enough back. So the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. Do you know who you are? Do you have any idea who you are? Now, there's two concepts here. They're, they're, they're a contrast. They're diametrically opposed. and They sound theological, but you have to understand them while you're in this life. There is the spirit of adoption over here, and there's the spirit of slavery. 
The spirit of adoption points to the life that believers possess who have received the very spirit of God in their life and at the same time have been legally adopted as sons and daughters of the king. And your name has been changed. All your rights have been changed. Everything has been changed about your future. Everything has been changed about your status. Do you see that? It is the spirit of adoption. It is a child from the poorest country of the world who is adopted into a wealthy American family and who once lived in squalor now has incredible rights and privileges not just to go to college but support and love and companionship and, and family and dignity. Do you see what I'm saying? It is the spirit of adoption versus what? The spirit of slavery. And it really represents so many people in the world who are refugees today. They don't know where they're going to wind up. They don't know if they're going to be alive. They don't know if they'll have a home. They don't know if they'll stay with their families. But what's the point you're saying? Thank you. It, it is a spirit of insecurity. Or God is my boss. He's not my father. I, you know, I could lose my job. And so there's anxiety. I don't have any boldness when I come to God. Paul said to Timothy, the Spirit of God does not give us a spirit of timidity and fear, but of love, peace, and power in the Holy Spirit. Amen? Do you see the difference? You're not going to remember everything that God has for us this morning. But Paul is setting up this dualism, the spirit of adoption, and the spirit of slavery. And it says those who are in Jesus are no longer slaves. We're not uncertain. We feel uncertain. We hear the accusations of the evil one, but we are no longer in that state of perpetual uncertainty. And we have received the things that God has prepared for us. Now, ladies, many women have reacted instinctively here and perhaps... Rightfully so. But Paul is using the concept of sons for a reason here. In biblical times, historically, women had no right to the inheritance. Let's face it. If it wasn't not the, until the last so many hundred years in America, they didn't have the right to vote. So rights for women and dignity for women come from the gospel. We could spell that out over hours, a period of time. But women had no right in the inheritance. The oldest son, of course, would get the largest sum of the inheritance. He would be the primary heir of the land and the cattle, the family name. But if a woman never married, she had desperate straits in, in her future. But now, Paul is saying, male and female are included as sons of Christ in inheritance. Do you see that? And so, ladies, you have full inheritance. It's a radical notion for the first century, taken for granted today. We are now heirs of Christ and fellow heirs of God. And because of that, because God is not our boss and because we're not slaves, because we're not just servants and we're more than friends, even though he calls us friends, we have a unique relationship with God that every person is yearning for. And because of that relationship, we call God what? Abba, Father, Daddy, Daddy. Daddy. It is unheard of in the religions of the world. It is completely unknown that a believer could know God in the depth of his soul and call him Daddy, 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 Daddy. And my name has been changed. I am a little Christ. I'm a Christian because legally Christ has purchased the rights to my life by the giving of his own life on the cross. Do you see that? So what the Bible is saying is, you don't know who you are. That's the problem. We forget who God is. We forget who we are. But the Bible is saying rest. And by the way, when I speak of rest, it doesn't mean be lethargic and go to sleep. Do you know how a swimmer rests? Anybody here a swimmer? Anybody here ever swam in their life? <laughs> Anybody want to race me in swimming? I'm an asthmatic. You should win. A, a swimmer has to rest. They're kicking while they're resting. They're gliding. They're waiting for the next stroke. But there's, they're, while they're moving, the body's resting. They're not what, doing what I do. is what? Flailing in the water. <laughs> yeah. No, it's a, no I, the, the asthmatics can swim probably better than me. But um, there's a restfulness breathing-wise. They're not fighting the water, do you see? But they're moving. 
people that don't swim well fight against the water. And we exhaust ourselves. I'm not speaking for you. I'm speaking for me. All right? So when I say rest in your adoption, you say, well, let's just go to sleep until Christ comes. I mean, stop being so upset about every little thing and realize that you're being treated as a son or a daughter who's been adopted by the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit and who is cherished. And resting in your adoption means stop sweating about every little thing in life. And I know you're saying easier said than done. That's right for me too. But it is the promise of the Word of God. Tim Keller uses the illustration in one of his messages of two ladies that go into the city with their purses. You all have purses this morning, ladies? I have a purse, too. It's a big wallet. Here's my purse, and it's got a lot of stuff in it. And he said they each had $1,000 in their purse and a lot of their records, driver's license, you know, all your credit cards, and a little piece of paper they are important. And somehow or another, one of them lost it through uh, leaving it in the restroom, and another had it stolen in a, left in a taxi cab or something. And he said they were both panic-stricken. Terrible inconvenience. Any of you ever lose your driver's license? No? You never lose anything, huh? Okay. One person did. Or you, or you lose credit cards and you don't have the phone number to call? Have you ever done that? No? We said they lost everything in there. And uh, they were both decimated. And for the one person who had nothing else, really, that $1,000 was it. It was a crushing blow. But the other lady had just received a legal inheritance from a settlement of a court case that had lingered for years. And she had been alerted one day before that she was about to have $10 million wired into her bank account. How did she look at the loss of the purse? Kind of an inconvenience, but oh well. Huh? Man, but tomorrow, we'll start over. I'll go to DMV and wait on the two-hour line and I'll do my driver's license application again and I'll find out those crazy credit card numbers, but I have $10 million being wired into my account. What am I so worried about? A thousand bucks. And, and Keller says, that's what's happened to the Christian. Life is going to crush you and steal your joy. You're going to face some things this week which are absolutely earth-shaking, perhaps. But what has been wired into your account is not just physical money, but everything that Jesus Christ has inherited is yours. And so you say, oh boy, I've got a tough week coming, but oh well. See the difference? I've got, some tough, I've got some tough meetings this week. I've got some interesting discussions I have to have with people. I've got some challenging things I'm facing, but, well, in the light of eternity, wow, it'll work out. Amen? You say, well, I didn't know I inherited everything that Christ has inherited. How do you, why don't you tell me that? I do try to tell you that. That's why we're here. And the Word of God tells you that as you begin to cash in on the blessing of the gospel. And so you rest in your adoption. Now, of course, it does say here, you always got to be looking at every little thing in the text. It says what? Provided we suffer with him in order that we may be glorified with him. Now, that's not a sermon on suffering right now. But it means we take up our cross and we feel the pain of this world and we experience the hardship of this world and we fight against the physical ailments of this world We battle with illness and cancer. And yet we are overcomers. Amen? And so if you've never known Jesus Christ, please understand what you're missing. And those of you that know Christ, understand your identity. Rest in your adoption. Here you go. All right. Because your purse is much fuller than you ever realized. Second, waiting That's about as popular a word in the church as the word patience because they're friends, waiting and friends. Waiting with certainty and joy. For I consider that the sufferings of the present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. And again, the other translations translate it in us. To us, in us. 
For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. There are some things worth waiting for, huh? I have to tell you there are some meals worth waiting for at a restaurant, and then there are some that are not worth waiting. Back in Michigan, we had a restaurant we really liked, and we had a number, and, um, and it was always packed on weekends. That's a pretty good sign, isn't it? Beware of the restaurant you enter and there's no one there. There's a reason for that. And uh, the hour would go by so quickly. And they'd have this cheese and crackers to, while you're waiting. So you'll fill up on that and not eat their food. But it didn't, I didn't mind it. Because it's only an hour and 15 minute wait, huh? Now, we're in a city out other than Denver. And everybody was downtown. And the restaurants, whether they were good or bad, were all packed. And I think we waited close to two hours for a meal, frankly, that was not worth waiting for. Huh? You had that experience? So sometimes waiting is easy. And sometimes it's very hard. <coughs> Excuse me, a friend of mine whose family is waiting to die said, you know, you really discover what you believe when your body starts to disintegrate and you start to lose your mind and you're starting to come apart, you will find out where the rubber <clears throat> meets the road what you really believe about Jesus Christ and your future. I thought about it. Wow. Now, that's why you have to hear the Word of God now so that it is buried in your soul. Buried in your soul. You know, Jonathan Edwards, the great American theologian, considered one of the great theolo theological minds in America, who was a pivotal figure in the great awakening of the 18th century, 1740s, Massachusetts, that led, uh, many scholars believe, to the formation of our nation and the Declaration of Independence and all of that. Edwards died in 1756, way before his time. <clears throat> and his church in um, Massachusetts had a big fight over communion issues, and they wound up letting go probably the greatest pastor America's ever known. And so at that time, he had become the president of Princeton University. But back in those days, 18th century, 1750s, the whole concept of vaccinations were a very new thing. And he had received a smallpox vaccination. But the body reacted to it and he became delirious. And he had moved to Princeton to begin his presidency. And his family was still in Massachusetts. And he wrote them a letter as he was losing his mind. And by the way, as he became, became closer to death, he said, Oh, my dear Jesus, I, I love you so much. Where are you now? I will be with you soon. But he wrote his family had many kids. I'll have to find out exactly how many. And he said, I entrust you to a father who will never let you down. I entrust you to a father who always does what's right. Isn't that something? And so when you're waiting to die, which we all are doing, you will find out what you really believe. Now, <clears throat> Waiting with certainty and joy is a very, very tough thing to do. There is a balance, by the way, between waiting for eternity. Some people are always waiting for the future. A balance between waiting for the future and the glory to come, the good things to come, and living in the moment. Capturing the God-given moments that He gives us right now. 
I don't have to wait to preach the gospel. I don't have to wait to see God move. I'm already experiencing the thrill and the exhilaration of being God's servant and bringing you the Word of God. That is right now. That is this precious moment that will never come back again. And so there are many things that say, Oh, Lord, if only this would happen. If only this would happen. If this could happen in my life, it would be great. It would be great. But right now I have this. I have this. I have this. Do you see that? These are the moments at hand. There's a balance there that the Bible gives us. But there are times in your life and mind when the moments do become unbearable. And we'll get to that in the third principle when it speaks about the Spirit groaning in us. That we groan differently than the world does. Sometimes the moments are so hard. And the Bible says that everything in creation is waiting right now with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. And if you're new to the Bible, you're saying, now what does that mean? I thought we already are the sons of God. I'm glad you brought this up. I thought we were already complete in Christ. Yes, we are status-wise. But friends, we still have to put this body down. We still can be grouchy at times. You say, speak for yourself. All right, I can be grouchy at times. We still wrestle with sin all the time. And we're still a mortal body headed for the grave. The fullness of our salvation, which begins when? When we receive Christ and enter his kingdom. The fullness of our salvation will take place after we die. When the mortal body is put down and we receive an immortal body and the full inheritance that our soul is longing for. And we are going to be so beautiful that C.S. Lewis says, if you looked at the person worshiping next to you right now, you would see someone that is so incredibly beautiful in the future. Beautiful now because we love to affirm one another. But so beautiful in terms of who you are as a person indwelt by the Spirit of God. The, the radiance of the person you're sitting next to and their absolute glory would overwhelm you. And I just paraphrased C.S. Lewis there. And so all of creation, not just the doggies, not just the mountains, not just the, the whales, all of creation, as beautiful as it is, has experienced the fall of man and has been subjected to futility in hope, one of the most important expressions in Scripture, until the revealing of the sons of God, until we are the final manifestation of what God is doing in us, not just saving us from our sins, not just giving us a new inheritance, not just giving us a new legal status, but when the glory of God is revealed to us and in us, when we become complete in Christ and we shall be like Him and we shall see Him as He is. Do you see that? And if you're asleep, please wake up and see it. All creation is waiting for what will take place in us. And so I wait, I wait through the trials of life not with boredom, not with cynicism, not only with anguish. Yes, I wait with certainty and joy. Some of you are saying, I want that joy this week. I want that joy. So what has happened is I've been saved. And I am being saved. Do you see the difference? And I what? Will be saved. And that salvation is mind-boggling. All right, let's turn to C.S. Lewis. He's, and this time I won't paraphrase him. Fair enough? All right, thank you. He says, He is going to make us into creatures that can obey the command, Be ye perfect. He said in the Bible that we were God, small g. And He is going to make good His words. If we let him, for we can prevent him. If we choose, now please don't miss this, he will make the feeblest and the filthy of us, filthiest of us into a god or goddess, a dazzling, radiant, immortal creature, 
pulsating all through with such energy and joy and wisdom and love as we cannot now imagine. A bright stainless mirror which reflects back to God perfectly, though of course on a smaller scale, his quotes. His own boundless power and delight in goodness. The process will be long and in parts very painful. But that is what we are in for. That is what we are in for. Nothing less. He meant what he said. Isn't that beautiful? That, by the way, is one of the classic books of all time, Mere Christianity by C.S. Lewis. And that's enough to make a Presbyterian get up and do what you do. All right? Amen? You're awake. Praise God. All right. Thirdly and finally, you say, why do we have to do groaning last? Well, because the Scripture includes it in this context here. You say, oh, man, I wish I could know this. Oh, this is good stuff. But I've got to go back to work tomorrow. I've got to visit my uncle in a nursing home and watch him die. Groaning with deep hope. Look, listen to the Word of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Holy Spirit, deposit of God in your heart, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as the sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with deep patience. Oh my, oh my, oh my. Now why does the um, Holy Spirit groan within us or sigh? Well, it's interesting. I'm going to answer my own question for you. (laughs) When Jesus healed a man in... Mark 7, he was a deaf a mute. And I just want to give you this little bit of scripture here to give you the context of the sigh of Christ. And by the way, in the Greek, it's the same word for groaning. Oh, someday I'm going to do better. Oh, this is hard. You see? Then Jesus returned from the region of Tyre and went through Sidon to the Sea of Galilee in the region of Decapolis. And they brought to him a man who was deaf and had a speech impediment. And they begged him to lay his hand on him. And Jesus, taking him aside from the crowd, privately he put his fingers into his ears. And after spitting, he touched his tongue. Christ healed differently every time and every person. And looking up to heaven, he sighed. Or he groaned. And he said to him, a patha that is be opened. And his ears were open, his tongue was released, and he spoke plainly. Now, if you're thinking ahead here, which I know you always do, you're usually one step ahead of me. You say, well, why was he groaning when he knew as the Son of God and the Son of Man that he was about to heal this gentleman? Why is he going to say, hey, let's get to it, great stuff. Okay, why did he cry then over the, uh, the tomb of Lazarus? Why did he weep over the city of Jerusalem? He knew in the end all things would work out for the glory of God because Christ in his incredible compassion, and by the way, the compassion of Christ is critical for you and me. He has such a love and such a burden in seeing what sin does to lives. Haven't you ever looked at a a friend maybe or somebody you didn't know very well and you say, oh boy, why do they keep on this road? Oh, I just hate to see them destroy themselves. And it's worse if it's your own kids. It's a deep groaning. But he wept over Jerusalem and he wept over the grave of Lazarus because he saw the horrible consequence of sin. And he also knew that he himself would experience that full penalty of the cross. And when Jesus sweated drops of blood, it was a visible expression of the groaning of his soul who said what? Take this cup, Father, away from me. But, but, not my will, but thy will be done. And so the creation 
is waiting and groaning. And things are not the way they should be or will be. And so in the midst of this life, as our mortal bodies begin to break down, what does the Bible say we do? We wait eagerly for our adoptions as sons produced by the redemption of Jesus Christ who purchased you and brought you to himself and who will give you a new body one day that will be such a delight that right now it makes every physical and emotional pain seem so insignificant. And those of you that are up in the age, you realize that every day you get older, you get closer to the youth that is coming for you. And by the way, the, Edwards wrote about the, the composition of the immortal body, things that are way above my pay grade. And he said, in our, in our immortal existence, we will not only have the wisdom of the aged, but we will have the vitality of the youth. Isn't that amazing? Oh my. It'll be the perfect coming together of young and old together. Now, just a word of warning to those of you that persist against the gospel. Outside of Jesus Christ, please hear this, the groaning of this world never ends because the pain of your sin will carry with you for all of eternity. And so the only way to escape the groaning of the broken hearts of this world is to revel in the gospel and the glorious inheritance that is in store for all who believe. Do you remember what it's like to have children before Christmas? Amen? Grandparents, have you forgotten that quickly? How kids wake up at night and look down at the tree and they sneak around looking for presents. Huh? I was good at that. And the days are counted down. That's what it's like for the children of God. We are like children waiting for the glory that will be revealed in us and to us. And the word of God says, wake up, church. Wake up, wake up, wake up, wake up, wake up. Tell your neighbor, wake up, wake up, wake up. For your salvation is nearer now than when you first believed. Amen? Let's fall before Christ and revel in him right now alone. Lord Jesus Christ, your word is everything, and it goes forth in the power of your spirit. Again, forgive the sins of the one who stands in this pulpit. Let nothing, nothing hinder the full reception of the glory of Christ. And Father, we need this perspective, but it's more than just a mental perspective. It is an absolute transformation of the way we see life and the way we live life. And we repent of our sins, O oh God. And so, Father, we teach us to rest in our adoption this week when the restlessness of this world comes against us. Father, teach us to wait with certainty and joy when we're just tired of waiting for stuff. Give us the right balance and the wisdom to wait uh, for the right things and to wait in the right areas. And Lord, in our groaning, we do so with deep hope for the coming glory to complete our salvation. If there's someone here this morning or via, watching via the internet who's never, ever entered the kingdom of God and followed Jesus and received the life-giving Spirit of God, and your heart has been softened this morning. And there's a new desire to know God. And you say, I want Jesus in my life. And if you'd pray this prayer, oh Lord Jesus Christ, come into my heart and take control of my life through the power of your Holy Spirit. I give you my shame, my filth, my sin, my darkness. You give me your beautiful, perfected record and righteousness. And I receive a righteousness that is foreign to me. And I revel in your glory and I become a child of God, a son or a daughter of the King. And your Holy Spirit lives in me. If you've prayed that prayer, you've entered the kingdom of God. Please let someone know. 
And as we have our healing time right after this, come down and let us know if you've received Christ or committed yourself to Jesus today. And Father, for those of us who name the name of Christ, we ask that your word would so encourage us and that we would stop drinking from toxic, broken cisterns, but instead drink freely from the water of life. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Before I pronounce the benediction, the elders are going to come forward and pray for you. And um, some of you have been waiting for a breakthrough from God for a long time, and I can't predict what God would do because we don't control God. So elders, every one of you, please. The uh, oil is right here. And um, maybe, you've never, uh, maybe you've never been bold to ask for God. That you, maybe you're doubting what God can do. Uh, again, I, that's between you and God, but I'm going to encourage you to come and pray this morning. Elders, two by two, just like in Noah's Ark. We're not bringing animals in, though. All right, I'm going to pray, and then if you need prayer, somebody to come to you, the elders will do that. So let's pray together. Lord Christ, heal us, touch us, free us, unburden us by the power of your glory. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Please turn my mic off.
you stand for the benediction? And please take the hand of the person standing next to you. And I have to remind you that next Sunday is the first Sunday of October, which is Worldwide Communion Sunday, okay? Once a year. And the entire Reformed Church shares together on that Sunday. The churches celebrate the Lord's Supper at many different times. Some every week, some every six weeks, some once a month like we do. It's up to each church. But on the first Sunday of October, the Reformed Body of Christ, non-Roman Catholic, um, share together in worldwide communion. Okay? So you'll know. Oh, it's the first Sunday of October. This is... This is a special time with my eternal family all over the world. All right, let's pray one for another. Now unto him was able to keep you from falling and to present you before his glorious presence with great joy, without blemish. To him be glory, power, and majesty, and authority in Jesus Christ and in his church, now and forevermore. Amen and amen. Amen. Five minutes.